Hi, I'm Darren Morton and this is Happiness by Design. In this episode, we're going to consider why you do the things that you do. Recently, I caught up with some individuals who asked them just that very question. All right, Mitro, you are a phys ed student at Avondale College, and that must mean that you like exercise, is that right? I love it. What Good. sort of exercise do you like? Our triathlons. So here's the question, why do you do it? it keeps me body in shape, feel good about myself. Sport and Recreation Coordinator at Avondale College. Harry, why do you do what you do? Well, first, I, I enjoy what I do. I have a passion for it. I love sport, but more importantly, uh, I love the people. I love the, the students. Hello, Jess. Jess, <laughs> you have a vacuum cleaner. It looks like you're cleaning. Yes. Do you enjoy cleaning? No. Uh, so why would you do it then? Um, pay for college fees. <laughs> Wayne French, college chaplain at Avondale College and bus driver extraordinaire, it looks like. <laughs> yeah. Wayne, I need to ask you, why do you do what you do? Um, I do what I do because I love it. Flower Deaconess at Avondale College Church. Jan, why do you do what you do? I just love flowers. Dr Ewan Ward, Senior Lecturer in the Faculty of Science. Now Ewan, what do you lecture? Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. And why do you do that? I just enjoy making really, really difficult things understandable. It gives me a real buzz. To help me understand why we do the things that we do, I have with me psychologist Nathan Hawkins. Welcome, Nathan. Hi, Darren. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on the show. Now, being a psychologist, I'm going to get you to analyse some obscure behaviour <laughs> that I sometimes find myself participating in. <laughs> Sounds interesting. Let me tell this story, and, and I'll let you analyse it for me. I, um, it's rather embarrassing, actually. I don't know why I'm doing this, but <laughs> I, uh, I want time I was walking past the television, I was innocently minding my own business, when there was this show evidently on about worms. And I'm not talking about the garden variety, I'm talking about the, the internal variety. The internal variety. Right. And, uh, anyway, I saw this image and it sort of scarred me, it just sort of was implanted in my, my brain if you like. And so anyway, I found that I, I tried to you know, get rid of it, but that night when I went to bed, I was lying there, and I must stress here, that I wasn't showing any symptoms. <laughs> no symptoms, all right? No, this is a symptom-free belly. Nothing uncomfortable. Nothing uncomfortable, but every time I closed my eyes, I'd see these pictures, these images that I didn't want to see. <laughs> and then you start sort of thinking, well, maybe I do feel a bit strange in the tummy, you know, mm -hmm. I don't, it's just a psychosomatic thing, I imagine. Yep. And, uh, and then so anyway, I turned to my wife, and, uh, and I should, I, I need to tell you that um, at this point in time, we'd had no children, so it was, we were relatively newly married. And uh, I said to my wife, I said, hey, um, next time you go to the shopping uh, supermarket, can you uh, get some worming tablets? I heard that you should worm the family. <laughs> she said, oh, you can't get worming tablets from the, the supermarket. You, you need to go to the chemist for that. And I said, oh, well, we'll go to the chemist then. Yeah, that'd be great. And she goes, you want worming tablets, you go <laughs> buy them yourself. And so anyway, I sort of thought, well, I'm not going to the chemist to do that. And so I put it off for a couple of days, but when these <laughs> images kept coming into my head, eventually I resigned myself to the fact that I'd have to do it. And so obscure behaviour, I don't go to the local chemist, I go to this chemist several <laughs> suburbs away. Right? Now obviously what's going on in my head, I, I don't want people to sort of suspect that maybe I've got some problems. So anyway, when I, f I finally front up at the counter to this chemist, I find myself for some obscure reason standing right at one end there and when the, the lady asked me if, uh, if, I, if she could help I was talking in very quiet tones like this <laughs> until she came close and then I, then I explained her that I was after a family worming kit and uh, I said, I, I heard that you should worm the family every uh, you know, six months or so. <laughs> she said, no worries, she said, so how many people would be in your family? <laughs> now I found my, my mind is racing and I thought if I say one, she's going to look at me and go, this guy's got worms. So for some of us, and, and I thought, you know, in the, in, the, in the heat of the moment, I thought if I say two, it's like 50-50. And so for some bizarre reason, I find myself childless, but saying three. <laughs> and this, uh, this lady turns to me, she said, so that would be you, your wife and child. And so I was just going with a flow by this time. <laughs> sure. This woman made me work for it. She said to me, so how old would your child be? And so I'm like, oh no. And I'm thinking, mate, I don't think I'm going to the good place for this. <laughs> so I tell her that she's, my, my child is three. On the way, she leads me to you know, show the different products. She's asking me how old she is and what her favourite things are. And I tell you what, I walked out of that place just thinking, 
what would compel me to do something like this? This is obscure behaviour. What is it that drives us to do the things that we do? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great story, and I'm glad you followed through. Yeah, that, uh, so I'm glad I got off my chest. That you were persistent, and, that, <laughs> and I'm glad she was doing her job. It sounded like she put you through the ringer for she that did. one. She did. It's an age-old question. I guess that's why people are interested in things like psychology, is that question of why do we do what we do? Why do we behave in the way that we behave? And a, a major factor of it is of human behaviour is motivation. What are the things that motivate us? And there's a huge number of things and I don't know, I'll, I'll pull out a few things that might be in your story, I'm not sure, we'll see. And you can, uh, you can answer those questions on your own of whether that's the case or not. But one of the biggest things that, that affects our motivation is the people that we have around us. You know, our, our family, our, our direct family, you know, our parents, they have a significant influence on the things that motivate us because they affect our knowledge, they affect our attitudes, they give us a belief system, a value system. Mm. They're such an integral part of our development that it's inevitable that they are part of the one piece of the puzzle of what motivates us. But it's also a bit bigger than that. It can be the wider network of people that you associate with or that you have as friends because you are friends with those people because you share some of these common things and that might be common things of workplace or common things of values and beliefs such as you know lots of friends that I have go to the same church as me for example. So we share we share things there which again are part of this puzzle of what motivates us what what makes us do the things that we do mm. but then there's wider society as well right yes there's there's where we live what country we live what freedoms we do or don't have how much money we have what are the laws and and those sorts of things in that country that forms part of why do we do what we do as well so there's this huge tapestry if you like of all these different things that affect what motivates us but you know, for the ease of trying to explain this or answer this question of, of what motivates us, why do we do what we do, it's, it's common to think of it in terms of two things, in terms of a positive and a negative or a pleasure and a pain, mm. these two opposing, opposing influences if you like. Right, so now, you know, in the limited amount that I've sort of read in the psychological arena, because obviously I come from a physiological perspective, Sure. it seems that psychologists have had a lot to say about motivation and trying to understand what mm. drives people's behaviours. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it seems that what you're explaining is that it is a, a very complex mm. issue, really, isn't it? Yeah. But you're saying at the heart of it, there's, there's the basics, the, the pleasure pain thing that we, we often hear about. Yeah, it's a, it's a good way for us to look at it and, and uh, explain it in a, in a simple, ter you know, simple terms because trying to, to categorise and weigh up all of this multitude of things is quite difficult. But if we think of it in terms of pleasure versus pain, it tends to simplify the explanation a little bit. Okay, so let's do that. Let's let's have uh, consider some some different scenarios perhaps mm -hmm. from this this basis of pleasure and pain. And I like. Well, the thing is, a physiologist that appeals to me is because when we look inside the, the brain and the bra way the brain is configured, we actually know that your emotional centre, mm. the limbic system, is also responsible for your drive. So it, it makes that, it's almost as if physiology and psychology concur on that. Yeah. That, um, that what we do, we tend to do for a feeling at yeah. the heart of it. Yeah. So let's flesh that out more after the break. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Darren Morton, talking with Nathan Hawkins about why we do the things that we do. Now, Nathan, before the, the break, you explained that at the heart of it, you know, whilst the whole issue of motivation and why we do the things that we do is, is quite a complex one, mm. and psychologists mm. have had a lot to say about it, there's numerous theories, they have a great time Absolutely. talking about it. Yep. Um, at the heart of it, though, it seems that we are motivated by pleasure and pain, yeah. feelings, and um, as, a, as a physiologist, I would agree with that because mm. that's the way our brain is, is wired up. Our emotional brain mm -hmm. is responsible for, for, the, for our motivation as well. Yeah. But to say that, to say the things that we, what we do, why we do what we do is for a feeling, to, mm -hmm. to achieve pleasure or to avoid pain, seems a little bit simplistic because you see that there are instances um, that I observe that that doesn't seem to be weighing up all the time. Let me give you a classic example and you can do the analysis for <laughs> me. Um, I have students, my students, 
and I, I watch them out there and it gives me great joy. It warms my heart when I see them studying for a test or, a, or an exam that I, I've set for them. Mm. Now I'm assuming uh, that that's probably not that pleasant for them to be doing that. So why are they motivated to participate in it? Yeah, you're right. Look, for the majority of students, studying in of itself doesn't have much pleasure attached to it. But what they're actually doing is studying to avoid something. And what they're trying to avoid is the pain component. So it's not so much they're studying for the pleasure of it, maybe one or two in your class are if you're really <laughs> lucky, but they're really studying to avoid the pain and the pain of failure in this case. And you might even be able to think of students in your class or, or parents might be able to think of their kids and differences that they might have observed with them of maybe even um, one child in a particular class being heavily motivated to avoid that pain of failure because in their family or even maybe just intrinsically, Achievement is really important to them. Academic achievement is important to them. Right. We also see with some students though where maybe academic achievement isn't an important factor for them that they, that they um, may not be as motivated to study or they may study just enough just to pass you know, but, but doing really well isn't a motivation for them. So now what you've indicated there, that would suggest then that we, that, that we sort of are more motivated to a, to avoid pain mm -hmm. than we are to achieve pleasure, which in fact that makes sense in, in the case of many of my students. Mm -hmm. I, I see students that are very capable, for example, who will only do enough just to pass mm. and I suppose for them it would be painful to, mm -hmm. um, to, to fail. Obviously they're going to have to pay new fees, <laughs> then they're going to have to sit in my class and listen to me yep. babble on again for a whole other semester. So they'll do enough to avoid the pain. Mm. But then they won't go the extra mile and do enough. They're not motivated to do enough to get very good grades, even though they're capable of it. Yeah, it's partly to do with the importance of each of those factors, of the pleasure and the pain. And it's, this is where it starts to, we begin to paint a more complicated picture again. But, but for those students where avoiding pain is very important to them, avoiding the pain of failure in academic performance, when that's very important to them, that's when they, they strive to achieve well. Mm. But for other students, that level of importance is down a few pegs and they're trying to balance it off against pleasure, maybe this afternoon of going out with my mates or going to the movies or wherever it might be. They're trying to find this balance of finding the minimum amount uh, or sorry, the maximum amount of pleasure that they can do, the minimum amount of study that they can do, right. offset against this importance of passing my course, what are my parents going to think of me getting through the exams. Un unfortunately, not all my students get that balance quite right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let me give you another scenario then. I'm thinking um, of, of athletes in, in athletic circles. Sure. Where athletes will endure all manner of pain day in, day mm. out, and yet are still motivated to, to go back to the pool or go back to the track or, or go back to wherever their, their training environment is. Yeah. Why do they do that? Yeah, that's a good one because it's quite different to the students that we were just talking about where they're avoiding pain and that's their most powerful motivator there. These guys are not avoiding pain at all. In fact, they're actually participating in it, it every day. Mm. And what we find there is that it was, this is a bit more of a complicated picture now. Where in addition to the importance of the pleasure versus the pain, we've also got the powerful effect that those feelings can have. And a person also weighs up how powerful is each of these, these feelings. The feeling of pleasure versus the feeling of pain, which one is going to have the most power over my life? So it's almost like we succumb to the, the, the feeling of greater intensity. Yeah, yeah, like. that's a good way to describe it. So for an athlete, it could be days and, and in fact years and years of daily pain that's physical pain you know going through stresses upon their body and the like but what they're actually striving to achieve is the pleasure and for them that is the most powerful factor the pleasure of achieving well in their event possibly winning and lots of the things that can come along with that and that might be financial rewards it might be just simply a sense of intrinsic achievement you know there's different mm. factors for each person but they're in that case, they're not trying to avoid the pain, they're actually pursuing the pleasure. Mm. It's interesting, um, I'm even thinking, I mean, I, I actually have a great interest in, in exercise yeah. and, uh, and training. And I, I'm, I can think of, of times when you know, I've been sort of right into it and, and working very hard. It is painful, I mean, training is painful, but you almost derive a sense of, 
satisfaction. There's almost mm. a pleasure that comes with being able to follow through and discipline yourself and uh, and, and see it through. There is, and, and there's neurophysiology, neurophysiology that's behind that that explains part of that achievement that an athlete goes through. Um, the reward, you know, the brain rewards itself for following a disciplined approach and for set, for achieving the things that you've set out to achieve. Mm. And that can, be, um, that can be a challenge to achieve that, but uh, certainly there's benefits, benefits to it. So what we can say then is that you know, pleasure pain, at the heart of it, that's you know, why we do the things that we do. Yeah, but there's these little anomalies. You know, sometimes um, we'll, you know, well, the first, first port of call was that um, we'll do more generally to avoid the pain mm -hmm. than we will to achieve the pleasure. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes we'll actually succumb to the the feeling of greater intensity yeah which yeah. once again can help explain some behavior that doesn't quite seem to make sense yeah yeah we're getting any insights in terms of my worm story yet <laughs> well i think the motivating factor for you and at least one of the motivating factors the fact that you went to a different pharmacist down the road and huddled down the end of the counter whispering to the receptionist is you know, the pain for you in that circumstance which is what you were trying to avoid was was embarrassment you know you didn't want to stumble across one of your students or one of your friends or or to be pegged with a label that you felt was maybe a bit derogatory so you were maybe there with your students trying to avoid the pain in that circumstance so you think i'm a pain motivated individual well there might be a few things motivating there you've also got a bit of an athletic background and and so obviously there's a there's the powerful effect of the motivator as well as the intensity as you mentioned whether it's whether it's something that's particularly important to you achieving that that Right. Let's talk more about why we do the things that we do straight after this break. Welcome back. Talking with Nathan Hawkins about why we do the things that we do. We've been looking at different scenarios and, uh, and how this notion of pleasure pain and us being motivated by those two factors can come to play and how it's not always quite easy to see from the first appearance in certain scenarios yeah. why it is that people are doing these things and yeah. yet at the heart of it still that pleasure pain mechanism comes yeah. Into, yeah. into play. Let me throw you one last scenario. We have the instance where someone would risk pregnancy Mm -hmm. just for a chance, you know, sexual encounter. Yeah, one night stand or something yeah. like that. Now, I need to tell you, I have three young children. <laughs> I know the pain that, I mean, they're great pleasure as well, and mm. I love my kids dearly, but I know that the, you know, the, it changes your world when you have, uh, have young children. There's a lot of pain associated, a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of things that can be very taxing. That could be considered pain, you know, from, you know, I suppose, in anyone's... Absolutely. Uh, so why would people do it? Why would they do that? And even just the, the an unwanted pregnancy in particular can be yes. an incredible, painful oh, event. Absolutely. Um, it's a great question and a good example because it, it, it almost defies logic for a lot of people that not only risking pregnancy, but, but risking things like uh, sexually transmitted diseases and, you know, there's other things that people risk when they have a chance sexual encounter like that. I guess the third factor that weighs into this pleasure versus pain um, cycle is is that of probabilities. People base some of their decision making on what they perceive to be the chance of a certain event happening. And in the case of somebody um, risking pregnancy, for example, for a, for a sexual encounter, in their mind they might be weighing up things like knowing that they have a 100% chance of a pleasurable event in this sexual encounter right. versus what they see as being a reduced probability of these other things happening. Right. So a reduced po probability of the chance of pregnancy. They might say, well, maybe I've got a 50% chance of falling pregnant or maybe even less. Right. Or they might feel that they've got yeah, certainly less than 100% chance of contracting a, a sexually transmitted disease or something like that. And they combine that information with the things that we talked about earlier of, of how um, important is this event to me and how important to, how does it fit in amongst the you know the values and beliefs that i've been given by, by my family how does that influence and fit into the importance value that i give and the power value that i give to either avoiding those painful circumstances so for example maybe a young, young woman whose mum has 
fell pregnant when she was young and, mm. and, and raised her as a single mum, raised her daughter as a single mum, that young woman may attach more power to that painful event of avoiding pregnancy. Right. And so that, all of those three things start to weigh into the mind of that person, but probability is, is, is one of those. <clears throat> we have a term um, or terminology we, we, we say about in the heat of the moment, mm. in the heat of the moment. Um, it would seem that in that kind of scenario, the, there's pleasure associated mm -hmm. with that particular event. Mm -hmm. And that's there, mm -hmm. you know, it's right here, it's close to the event, the yep. event. whereas that pain, you know, might be down here in the, in the, in the future somewhere if it yeah. went badly for them. So does that shape our behaviour, drive our behaviour too? Yeah, absolutely. And even more so in circumstances where people don't, may not have a lot of time to process what's happening. So maybe, let's let's give this person credit that maybe they weren't planning for a chance sexual encounter like that but mm. if they don't give themselves time to process the information you know the pleasure of the event is closely attached in time to the event that's happening whereas all these other possibilities are down the track and may not come into the decision making because of that that distance that they have. Now I'm thinking it's, this might not even relate to um, you know, something as serious as, as a sexual mm. encounter it's you know, going shopping you know, it. It, well, I know I've got my cards maxed out, well, very close to it, and uh, I know that I've already got three of those things, <laughs> but I like them, you know, I like them, and you're, so... You're talking about shoes, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I'm that's, talking yeah, about shoes, right. you know me, yeah. you know me. So, um, you know, is that another instance where the, the pleasure associated with that particular event, it's close to what's going on now, that stuff comes later, yeah. so we'll worry about it then? Yeah, that's true. Shopping's a great example because... The pleasure is, is a reward system in itself that, that we use as a reward system and, and we can even think of an example maybe of somebody who's, um, who's trying to lose weight for example and for them the pleasure of that next piece of chocolate cake or the next Tim Tam, yeah. they, they weigh up the probability of 100% pleasure of, and, and enjoyment. Tim Tams of, are 100% pleasure. Absolutely, I think it's on the, la on the label <laughs> isn't it? But they're weighing up that 100% chance of pleasure by enjoying that Tim Tam versus maybe they perceive it as I might not put on weight from that Tim Tam or I've done extra exercise in the day which may mm. offset it or whatever it may be. But mm. there's lots of examples where we can think of where we go, what are the probabilities of this circumstance? And we combine that with this other information of what's important to us, mm. what has power over us and, and we piece together a decision making process. So, I mean, at the heart of it, we've talked about various different scenarios and how this pleasure-pain thing sort of comes together to affect mm. our, our, um, our motivation. At the, at the heart of it, though, it seems that, um, well, I'm thinking pleasure-pain, there's, there's two, I suppose, the polar opposites of each mm. other and, and extremes. And, and if we talk about the emotions that sort of fit with them, probably you've got, you know, in the pain, it's really fear, I would imagine, and, yep. and love at the, the yep. pleasure side of things. You know, so to what extent does, does those two very intense, strong emotions motivate people's behaviour? Um, an incredible amount. That's the, that's the short answer. We see examples every day in our society of where either love or fear has motivated somebody and mm. and sometimes they can be in really extremes of behavior so people have even likened love and being in love romantic love to being a little bit crazy because not all of our decision making may seem sensible or logical mm. we may not see certain things in the other person which other people may see there's all sorts of things that can go on with somebody who's um, either deeply in love and a romantic love or has love for their family or something like that mm. But we also see people motivated by fear. Maybe that's for job performance, the fear of not having an income or what effect that might have on their family. Mm. But sometimes we see it even in extreme circumstances of victims of crime and that sort of thing where, where they may have defended themselves or done something that they wouldn't normally be able to do to escape that fear, to escape mm. a predator or to defend themselves. Mm. Every day we see snippets of these things in, on the news or on TV, examples of people motivated by love or by fear. And I'm interested that, um, <clears throat> you know, one, one of the quotes, biblical quotes that often stays in my mind is, is perfect love drives out fear. Yeah. And so I think really what that does is, is change our whole behaviour system, our whole, the things that we're motivated towards, mm. the things that we're compelled to do. And you know, when I, when I think about this, and then I thank you for being on the show today with us, with us Nathan, it's fascinating stuff. I've always been intrigued by why people do the things that they do, but it seems to me that it was love mm. that inspired even God's greatest efforts. Mm. 
because his most remarkable act was actually conceived in love, wasn't it? Absolutely. I'm Darren Morton. Thank you for joining us today. And I'm reminding you to delight in God's design.